It's 1964. Government workers have no legal right to form a union. Meet the legendary leader of AFSCME, who moved public workers from collective begging to collective bargaining. I am Jerry Wirth. <laughs> AFSCME was my life. I was president of our national union from 1964 until my death in 1981. Historians call me labor's last angry man because I fought for public workers, marched in civil rights, and jolted the labor movement out of its complacency. I was unapologetic about the fire in my heart. I didn't have to search for indignation against injustice. It walked with me like an old companion. Yes, I was impatient. I was abrasive. I was demanding, aggressive, and driven. That's because I refused to compromise when it came to AFSCME and public workers. We expected reasonableness from our employers, and if they don't give it, we take it. <laughs> Dignity on the job, respect at the bargaining table, fairness in public employment, those are the things our union has stood for since members elected me as their president. You know that picture of a priest that hangs in the Council Five's office? That's Father Albert Blatz, the chaplain and president of Local 614 at St. Peter's State Hospital. He delivered the votes that made me president. Imagine a Catholic priest and a Jewish labor thug praying and drinking together. <laughs> Nothing could come between us, and we made sure workers were never divided by things like race, religion, reproduction. I'm the hard-nosed bastard who hired the men who lead asked me today. Lee Saunders and Elliot Sy were 27 when they came to work for me in 1978. I like that side, kid. <laughs> like me, he was a Jewish New Yorker schooled at NYU. I grew up in Brighton Beach section of Brooklyn, born the son of a tailor and immigrant parents from Austria and Hungary. My first job, I worked as a cafeteria cashier and organizer for the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. We fought the Yiddish-speaking cafeteria owners who called me Machamuvis, or the Angel of Death. <laughs> when I went to work for AFSCME in 1948, we had only 100,000 members. President Arnold Zander hired me as an organizer for District Council 37 in New York City. We had no legal right to strike. We had no collective bargaining. All we had was collective begging. By the early 1950s, I knew public workers were not going to be satisfied by having public officials unilaterally and patronizingly determine their social and economic destiny. Public workers demanded collective bargaining. They wanted the kind of organizations of representation that workers in the private industry had as a matter of legal right. Back then, it was impossible to push any collective bargaining law through the conservative New York legislature, so we worked on Robert Wagner, Jr., the Manhattan borough president who was running for mayor. We turned out every living body to vote for Wagner, and he kept his promise. He issued Executive Order 49, giving unions the right to organize New York City employees and to serve as their exclusive bargaining agent. AFSCME forged a unique partnership between public workers and the public. We're the union that cares for the sick and elderly. We keep our streets and roads maintained. We provide clean water for our cities, and we help raise and educate our youth. AFSCME takes care of people. That's why we must always be the conscience of the labor movement. Union democracy, civil rights, and pay equity are not just slogans for us. They're hard-won principles forcefully enunciated, that guide our behavior as AFSCME members. We organize low-paid government workers employed in the hospital and sanitation fields. It was our union that led a 65-day strike by Memphis sanitation workers in 1968. Back then, black sanitation workers were treated like the trash they delivered. They lifted heavy leather tubs of garbage the leaky refuse caused huge welts on their bodies. 
Racist supervisors told these proud black men that they couldn't use the restroom in their own workplace. Their struggle forged an alliance of labor and civil rights. Dr. Martin Luther King and black ministers gathered in Memphis to support the men several days before their strike. That was when I met Dr. King. We agreed we could not rely on the goodwill of those who profit from our exploitation. We agreed that it was not enough to have a seat at a lunch counter if you couldn't afford the meal. Dr. King was murdered the evening prior to our second march. Riots broke out across the country and I got federal intervention to end the strike and negotiate a first contract. Government workers have proved that when we're not dealt with justly, we will defy the law. And we have proved that in such situations, we can make government powerless. By daring to strike, even when strikes were illegal, we forced government to face the reality that anti-strike laws couldn't stop us. Our confrontational tactics forced many governments to adopt formal procedures for dealing with public employee unions. Now, let me tell you, I'm opposed to strikes. They're hard on the city, but they're way harder on the workers. I fought bitterly for the right to strike, but striking's only a tactic to get the employer to deal with us. If it can be avoided, I believe we need to pay almost any price in order to avoid the strike, except giving up our dignity. I call myself a labor organizer because organizing workers is the main function of a union. We grew our union member by member until we were one million workers strong by the time I was done. Most organizers think they're peddling better wages and working conditions. But you know what? Essentially, we're peddling dignity. That was the lesson of Memphis. Ask me in the AFL-CIO, well, let me tell you, we had our differences. George Meany preferred to lobby quietly in Congress while well, AFSCME lobbied loudly in the streets. We cleansed our union of ties to the CIA, and we were labor's lone dissenter opposing the war in Vietnam, where young working class kids were dying. That's why George never paid us respect. He considered AFSCME a bastard child, and he let those rapacious vultures from the building trades raid our union. I said, screw them. We at the top of the House of Labor should not accept the poverty that exists in America. You know why I was angry? I was angry because there was no anger among most of my brothers. And I was angry because they pissed away the power they could have had. The power to actually change things by really organizing and using political clout. The power to inform their own members and everybody else what was going on in the country. And for example, what a terrible class weapon the tax structure was for the rich. Now, I supported and the union supported George McGovern and Jimmy Carter for president, but they disappointed us, to say the least. They screwed public workers after the election, and it taught us a lesson. We need an arm's length relationship with the boss. If confrontation is necessary, we have to be prepared for it. I had a softer side, rarely seen by people outside my inner circle. My wife, Mildred, and our kids, Nicholas and Abigail, lived in Cleveland Park, a neighborhood favored by Washington liberals. The house was crammed with stereo equipment where I listened to classical music for hours. I followed the theater and I skimmed more books in a week than most people read in a year. I was a brain picker. So table talk in our house tended to be intellectual and political. My health sucked, but I never let it get in the way. I smoked cigarettes and I gasped from emphysema. My ulcers denied my body the nourishment it needed to survive. And I limped from polio that left my foot a dead mass of flesh and bone. Sometimes pain was etched in my face and sweat dampened my green shirt. But I always climbed the stairs to take on any boss or any politician who disrespected public workers. I am Jerry Wirth. I know you guys know this one. Does it sound familiar? If you know it, sing along with us.
that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Our union is behind us. We shall not be moved. Our union is behind us. We shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the by the water we shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water we shall not be inspiration through the union's blood shall run there will be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble, feeble strength of one for the union makes us strong solidarity forever solidarity In our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Everybody! Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. Solidarity Thank you so much. 